Doesn't look like much now, but back in 1968, that marquee was filled with flowers. Hi, I'm Michael Toda, and I'm standing in front of New York's Biltmore Theater. It was at this site back in 1968 that a new musical would open to rave reviews. That musical would eventually go on to become one of Broadway's longest running shows. It would spawn such songs as Aquarius and Good Morning Starshine. Those songs would become legendary by bands such as The Fifth Dimension and The Cow Sills. Well, tonight on Spotlight on the Arts, I'm going to introduce to you two men that made that play happen. That play was Hair. And those two men, well, one is the composer that wrote those songs, and the other, the director that brought it to the stage. So stay tuned to Spotlight on the Arts, only on Island 16. I'm Michael Toder, and you're watching Spotlight on the Arts. My guests tonight include two men who have made an extraordinary contribution to Broadway theater. Uh, sitting next to me on my right is director Tom O'Horgan, director of Hair, Jesus Christ Superstar, Lenny, uh, instrumental in doing some work at La Mama, and sitting next to him is composer, direct, uh, composer and musician, and also Staten Island resident, Galt McDermott, best known for his uh, score to hair, but also he's won a 1961 Grammy Award for Best Jazz Composition and a uh, Tony Award nomination for Two Gentlemen of Verona. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, <coughs> let's start off by uh, sort of telling your story, how you got started in... Well, let's in talk about that 1961. <laughs> <laughs> how you got started in, uh, in theater, what, it, what first attracted you. I read somewhere that you had... Uh, you had uh, aspirations of being a stage manager because you thought that that's what, what, a, what a director was. Boy, those stories do persist. It's true. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, that my, my father wanted to be in the theater, and his folks wouldn't let him. So when I showed any interest, he just pushed me into it. And one of the things I w went to see was always Busby Berkeley mo movies, and so I thought, that's what theater is, you know. So uh, I wanted to do that, and I thought it, that a director was a stage manager. <laughs> Gold, how'd you get your start? Starting in music. Well, I just liked, I just wanted to be a musician. Hmm. I liked uh, jazz. It was, it was really jazz that got me interested, that, that got me serious about music. I had played the violin as a kid. Uh -huh. But uh, when yeah, I heard... I never heard that part. <laughs> no, no, I don't talk about that. But I, I, that's how I started music, was on the really violin. Violin. And then when I, I started listening to Boogie Woogie when I was a kid, a little older, uh -huh. and jazz, Duke Ellington, and, and I said, this is what I want to do. Uh -huh. I wasn't really interested in theater. I didn't know anything about theater until I did hair. Uh huh. Now you had done. Uh, you'd lived in South Africa for a while. I lived there for three years. Yeah. And then what brought you to New York? And especially what brought you to Staten Island? Oh well, I, I, what brought me to Staten Island was I heard there was an apartment to rent. <laughs> 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 but I came to New York to try to make a you know a living in music because I was making a living in Montreal, but just as an organist. Uh -huh. Organist and a, a dance band, pianist, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, getting on the topic of of hair, uh, how'd you get how'd you get involved with hair and uh, and story? I mean, did you write the lyrics for? Uh, were the were the lyrics written before you wrote the music? Yeah, Rado and Ragney had written the book and lyrics, <coughs> and they were looking for a composer, and they happened to run into a guy called Nat Shapiro who knew me and knew I was looking for something to do. Uh -huh. So he put us together. Uh huh. Wasn't that an odd kind of combination? I mean, you know, the, them being uh, you know, all Broadway actors, long hair, and uh, seen some photos of you at that time, and you didn't, you didn't seem to be the fit in with the hippie. Uh. No, no, I wasn't a hippie, but <clears throat> I was just a musician. Mm -hmm. So it didn't seem to me to matter much what I looked like. Mm -hmm. no, it was okay. <laughs> right. Um, when, you got the, when you got the book and you got involved with, with hair, uh, there, there was a... Uh, what, what was your um, intent? What, what, what statement did you try to make? And it was a, sort of a tribal, tribal kind of thing, and that's, that's pretty much a lot of controversy around it. Well, I, I, you know, the, what, what happened was that uh, Jerry particularly was working at La Mama, 
and I knew him, and I knew Jim, and they said uh, they were writing this show, and I said, well, what is it called? And they said, we can't tell you because it's a secret. <laughs> and uh, so, and, but we want you to direct it. And I was, I was at that time, I had the La Mama troupe, we were just about ready to go to uh, Europe with them, I don't know, like the second trip or something that we did with a, a tour. And um, so by the time I came back, they'd already got it on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, it was an amazing thing. I saw it and I thought, well, I like the music, I like the idea, but somehow it, that production didn't talk to me. And they said, well, uh, we're going to take this to Broadway. And at that point, nobody had ever moved anything from off-Broadway to Broadway. Is that right? I didn't know that. Was that the, it was one of the first season at the Public? It was oh. at the Public, and then they took it to the Cheetah, which Cheetah. Was, a, uh, was a disco. And um, in there, uh, Bertrand Castelli came around, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it was very interesting. And so we, we sort of got together and, and did it. And I, I, my game was to try to fulfill what Jerry and Jim had seen, what they wanted to do, and uh, for various reasons didn't do it in that first production. So, uh -huh. um, so there was a lot of dancing in the aisles, and uh, and a, apparently there there was a a lot of controversy around. The, the new, nobody had done any kind of nudity on Broadway uh, mm -hmm. before, and there was this was like a, a big thing. And also there was a lot of um, political unsettlement. Uh, with well, the, I think uh, the piece was very political, and it was about what was going on. Though. I, I don't think that there could have been a more apt title and subject and music than that particular piece. It just all was exactly in that particular time. It just spoke what was everybody was thinking. Long hair, uh, kind of rock music, uh, and the subject which was all protests. And I felt personally when we were taking the piece to, uh, to Broadway that it was just a kind of sit-in. You know, like people would go and occupy a space to make a point. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's what we were doing. And uh, it's uh, like I was starting to tell you before that uh, Bob Downey Sr. came to one of the previews and I thought it was falling off the stage at that time. It just like, seemed like a complete mess to me. And he said, you have no idea what this is going to do. And I said, oh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, Gold, you had said that, that uh, your hair was the first production that you got involved with, the first Broadway play you got involved with. Yeah. Um, how did all the controversy surrounding the play strike you? Uh, you know, it was <coughs> I wasn't really aware of controversy, that there was any controversy. <laughs> I, I know that it was, um, there was a little problem in Boston when they went, when they went to Boston, there was some question about oh, that was later. Senate, yeah, the, but when we were doing it, the, well, downtown there was no controversy, and then when we went, when we did it uptown, I was so busy, I was playing the band, I was playing the piano. Uh -huh. I really didn't. Were you aware of controversy? Well, you know, I think that one of the things that was interesting to me, the, the nude scene, which of course kicked up most of the dust, I think. Um, we'd been doing nude scenes in off-Broadway, and off-off-Broadway for quite some time. Maybe not quite on that size and whatever. Um, and when I would do an interview at that time, I used to kind of count how long it would take, how many seconds before they'd get to the nude scene. <laughs> how long did it take us today? <laughs> Not very long. <laughs> but well, the point is that that was something. And, um, it, but it was absolutely within the boundaries of that plot. It was a bee-in, and that's what people did at bee-in. They took their clothes off and became free. Mm -hmm. And that scene was that, and the cops came and arrested them at the end of the act. So. Uh -huh. And people really thought they were cops. I know. Always knocked me out. <laughs> <laughs> and now you had this uh, thing I read somewhere that you tried to create uh, a place where there was no best seat in the house. So you, you know, people people were running through the aisles and and stuff. I mean, was that was well, that? I think this was a general feeling in in the modern theater <laughs> at that time, and uh, the idea, you know, the classic concept of the theater, there was the king's seat, which is the seat right in the center and everything is played on equal sides to that person and the rest of you forget about it. Well, I put pieces going on in the balcony and down and so that there was like, you didn't feel like you were, you know, uh, a special if you had a front seat or one in the back. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, wrapping up, we're going to have to stop now for a commercial break, but when we come back, we'll talk about some of the people that these two gentlemen have worked with. Stay tuned. <laughs>